we're going to present Wasabi Wallet and also some other privacy tools. So beginning, I just want to make a disclaimer. This is a technical presentation and I'm not making any financial, tax or legal advice. Nothing is perfect. You, you always have to consider every tool that I'll be presenting has some risks and has some issues and I'll be trying to talk about them, but you should be aware of the risk before using the presented tools. Everything presented here is legal in my country, Canada, and in most countries. However, there are some countries that have some bans going on, either for Bitcoin, either for Tor, or some other technology. So make sure to look up yours before involving yourself with the usage of any of these tools. Finally, if it's, uh, if it's this uh, in your particular jurisdiction or if it's another uh, thing. All right, so the presentation plan, we're not going to talk about Samurai Wallet to begin. Uh, because I, I discourage users from using it. I believe it's an incomplete solution uh, and the, the team behind it says some some bad, um, let's say, uh, not a lot of integrity when it comes to operating their, uh, their business. But we're going to talk about limits to Bitcoin privacy, what's the issue at hand, then how Wasabi Wallet works and how it resolves it. I'm going to show how it works by manipulating the wallet a little bit. I'm not going to go too... I'm not going to participate in a coin join. I'm going to explain later what that means. I'm not because it would take too long otherwise, and it has a cost. But I'm still going to show you how to use the wallet and how to install it. Um, at, at least not install it, but how to initialize it. And then I'm going to talk about VPNs, then Tor, the onion router. I'm going to finish with a mention on light wallets and node wallets. And finally, I'm going to talk about Wasabi and Wasabi API Cypher node for those who are more developers and businesses here. So, first of all, for those who don't know me, my name is Gustavo Flores de Chase. I'm head of product and research at Verify. I'm also a developer in JavaScript, React. I'm very passionate about Bitcoin and I'm a firm believer in free markets. I think Bitcoin reflects that. Verify, we do uh, many things involving Bitcoin such as consulting on direct development projects when it comes to application and web development projects. And we can also help people in, in add Wasabi and other privacy tools to their projects, which they might make some exchanges or other type of Bitcoin businesses might need. I'm also a Wasabi shield. There's like a, a fight going on. I'd say a, a dramatization in between Wasabi and Samurai. I'm on Wasabi side. I'll make that perfect, perfectly clear, uh, and it's only for technical reasons, and I'll present them in a second. So, first of all, limits to Bitcoin privacy. So, Bitcoin isn't the same thing as a bank account. Um, you you don't have your name attached to uh, to Bitcoin, but you do have, uh, but you can have your name attached to an address by an, and another individual can do that. So how does that work? Let's say I sell you some Bitcoin or you buy some Bitcoin on an exchange and on a website and you identify with that exchange or when it's me, you identify with me. Then I send you Bitcoins to an address and I know that I sent you because I identified you Bitcoins to that address. Then I have that address and I can follow that address to, I can follow the coins that are on that address to the other addresses that it's going. And then I can deduce by some analysis that it's still you. It's you're sending to yourself to just, you're just changing addresses, but I know that's still you. And this is based on some heuristics, which I'll explain in a second, which deduce that most more probably than not, you're the one who's owning the, the address that it's being sent the, the coins to. So we can explore uh, a bit a blockchain explorer in a second that can show you how addresses and bitcoins move around so that you can see how how, how they fall. It's not to identify your bitcoins to your to your name, but given that most countries force KYC, know your customer and anti money anti money laundering rules on a Bitcoin platform, it's hard not to link your name and your Bitcoin. So, however, there's ways to protect once you, you have done that. So, first of all, when you think about privacy, you got to think about the heuristics that are behind the, the, the analysis that someone can make, either an organization, a government, or another individual, to your address, or link your addresses between themselves. That's another thing. If I know this address is yours because I sold you Bitcoin to this address, 
And then I see that you are sending those Bitcoins and I can determine through the heuristics that uh, uh, you can find easily online. If you go on, let's say, Bitcoin privacy, uh, you Google that, you'll find the, the main heuristics that these analysis companies base themselves on. Well, just by having one address initially, I can follow that and get to the to the bigger size. So then there's network privacy. If you're using, let's say, a bread wallet and you're connected to, a, or you're, you're using, let's say, using the software Ledger Live, you're connecting to Ledger Live, you're connecting to Ledger, the corporation server. And you're probably doing it through your own IP address. So now Ledger knows that this device that they ship to your physical address can be linked to this wallet that and can be linked to this IP address. So now they've linked your they've linked your address, your physical address to your Bitcoin addresses in that way as well. So that can be done as well. So now Wasabi Wallet. Wasabi Wallet is the tool that I recommend to fix both blockchain and network privacy. Okay, so it's a desktop wallet that's available on, on Windows, on Mac, on Linux. It's also fully open source and the backend too. So it's you're connected to a server and that server is also open source and you can run your own server that you connect to. However, you're probably not gonna wanna do that and I'm gonna explain why not in a second. Also, for those who are more interested in the technical part, Wasabi is written in C Sharp and with the .NET framework. Also, Wasabi, which is interesting and which protects you from network privacy, is by default when you launch it with or without or with technical expertise, it's already wrapped with Tor, which means that it always uses Tor to connect to external sources, which protects your network privacy enormously. So, but also there's another issue when it comes to network privacy. And the other issue is that, let's say I connect, I give the, I return to the previous example, the one of Ledger. When I'm using Ledger, I can, when I connect to the Ledger server with Ledger Live, I'm telling Ledger all my addresses are mine. And I'm telling them, hey, this address, this address, this address, I'm talking about Bitcoin addresses, they're all, they are all owned by the same person. So they know that all these addresses, even if I put coins differently, someone looking at the blockchain won't necessarily know they're all owned by the same person. But Ledger, the company, they know. So Wasabi Wallet, what it does is that it uses a technology named Neutrino SPV, which is simple payment verification style or connection. And what this does is that it simply cannot allow uh, an external server that you connect to, to get the information from the blockchain, it cannot allow them to know that your addresses are linked between one another. And how does it achieve that? Briefly, it just pulls a lot of data to, to make the other party, uh, to give the other party just so much data that your addresses could be this or this or this. So they just give up and are not gonna focus on the analysis because the probabilities are just too big. Um, so whenever you're using, let's say, another SPV wallet, like Red Wallet, well, it's SPV as well. So you're not connecting to one server like you're connecting with Ledger. You're connecting to many servers, let's say, but you're still doing it in a way that isn't good for your privacy. Wasabi does it correctly with Neutrino. And on top of that, it's connecting through Tor. So even then, you're not only not exposing, not only linking your addresses between themselves, you're also not revealing your IP address, which is very important as well. So then Wasabi also has hardware wallet integration, but it's not available for CoinJoin. And finally, what CoinJoin is, CoinJoin is basically the fact that uh, the, the, the technique that pulls a lot of people together into, let's say, let's say we put everyone here where let's say 20 people and we all put a $20 bill in a jar. And then we just mix the 20 times $20 bills together. And then someone just pulls out, everyone just pulls another one out from the lot after they were mixed. We're probably not going to pick up the same. And someone who didn't watch what we did is not going to know uh, which put 
between. We're going to know who put what in and who took what, but we're not going to know how that was mixed. And that's CoinJoin. Basically, we just send 0.1 Bitcoin somewhere, and you get 0.1 Bitcoin from someone else in the same round, and then it just gets sent to another address. So the link that someone could follow through your addresses is now bro br breaking. Well, it's not breaking, it's just that now it's if we're 20 people, it's it has a 5% chance of being yours because there's 20 possibilities, right? It's either a 0.1 out of 20 options. So that's Wasabi Wallet in a nutshell. But you mix with around 100 peers, so it's even more. So it's either one in 100 that someone who's trying to analyze you, he's gonna he has the chances to fall on. And I'm gonna show you what it looks like in a second. But keep in mind that it's there's around a 0.15 fee every time you mix coins with Wasabi. Also, you have to keep in mind that the risks involved here are very minimal. So the risks are, first of all, there's a cost, 0.15 of your fees. Then you have to have minimum 0.1 Bitcoin to enter a Wasabi wallet coin join round. Finally, you have to understand that Wasabi wallet cannot steal your coins because they're never sent to them. They're always in your hands. You're just going to see how that works in a second. And also Wasabi wallet cannot de-anonymize you because you're always connected to Tor with Wasabi Wallet server and you're also using blind signatures which hides that the address that you're using before the round and after the round is not the same person. So even if you're connected to Tor, if you were using the same Tor identity, they could just know, ah, this person came in and it just came out this way. But since you're using blind signatures, it hides that how the person who came in and the person who came out is the same person. So even Wasabi Wallet cannot de-anonymize you in any way. And that's the crucial difference with Samurai Wallet. Samurai Wallet doesn't implement blind signatures. So it can st the, the server of Samurai Wallet can still de-anonymize you through weird ways. There's also the fact that when you're using Samurai Wallet, there's not Tor that's enforced. You can use Tor with Samurai Wallet, but it's not by default, like in Wasabi. Also, Wasabi Wallet, uh, Samurai Wallet is not a neutrino, neutrino SPV style. So in Samurai Wallet, you're always connecting. You're not always, but by default, you're connecting to Samurai Wallet server. So you're telling them all your addresses. You can also opt out of Samurai Wallet server by replacing the backend by your own open source backend called Dojo, but if let's say you're mixing with five people and the four people in, in Usamurai Wallet and four people out of five are not using their own backend server, their own Dojo, well, they're all connecting to Samurai Wallet server and they're all telling Samurai Wallet what their addresses are. So if you're the only one using your own node in a mixing round in Samurai and, and nobody else is doing it, well, it's very clear who that you came in and you came out, it's the same person because it's the only one that Samurai Wallet doesn't know all the addresses. So can deduce, they can easily deduce that it's you. So that's the difference between Samurai and Wasabi and that's why I recommend Wasabi. I also recommend Join Market, but it's way less user friend. And that's why I'm not gonna talk about it here. Uh, Join Market is different because it doesn't revolve around the fact that there's a coordinator as in Wasabi and Samurai, someone that is coordinating the round, which I'm going to show you how it, how it works. But instead, it revolves around the market. Join market is you have to find someone that will give you liquidity to, and you can use that liquidity to mix your coin with. So it's a market, there's a taker and there's a maker. So you pay a fee to someone else, but you can also be that someone else who provides liquidity to people wanting to mix their coins. So it's let's say it's way more decentralized join market but it also is just between two peers so there is less liquidity involved you're just mixing between two people instead of mixing with 100 people and how can how does it look like so here you have an example of how it looks like on the it's always just one transaction bitcoin transactions have inputs 
and output. Now inputs like a dollar bill you're taking out of your wallet. Let's say I take out two $20 bills. So I have two inputs, 20, 20. And then I give to the cashier, I want to give 30. I'm not going to, I cannot give 30. I have to give 40 and I get 10 back. So how you would see this is the input side, you would see 20, 20. On the output side, you'd see 30, 10. 30 goes to the cashier, 10 goes back to me. And that's how Bitcoin works as well. You have to put your inputs, which are your coins, and then where are those coins going and in which proportion? And that's how, uh, and, and here you can see a Wasabi wallet transaction. The inputs are on the left side and the outputs on the right. And on the inputs, you see every input is a different amount. And every, but however, every output is of the same amount. And this is just the beginning. The transaction goes all the way down. So you can see that every output that is just the same, do, how can we distinguish between every output? We cannot. They're all the same and they're all random addresses. So let's say that the, the, the number one of the inputs, the person who entered with 0 0.19900823, is we don't know who it is, who came out that, that is that person. Let's say I was trying to follow that person. I follow them through, through here and I got to here. Now I'm trying to follow their exit of this transaction and I just cannot distinguish it from the others. So I, if I'm trying to make a probabilistic analysis, it's either one out of all the ones here. So that's the beauty of Wasabi Wallet. And what does the, why do you pay a fee? You pay a fee for the coordination server to coordinate a transaction between everyone involved. You can see that it's impossible to follow someone entering to exiting. Well, it's not impossible. You just have very low probability of that. You have one out of 100 probability of following someone. So instead of being always like almost sure, 100, 50, let's say 50% to 100 chance that when you're following someone you're correct here it drops down to one two percent of chance when you're following someone you you can deduce that it's right so we can check out uh what it looks like on a on the real wallet so here you see this is what it looks like after you mix coins you would have all your coins and you would have a check a green check on each coin saying it's a, it's a mixed coin but I won't have that in my wallet because my wallet is empty uh, because I just installed it. So here we can go on Wasabi Wallet and you see that first you have to generate a wallet. So I'm just going to make a quick example. Well, first you have to agree to the terms and conditions. And the terms and conditions are mostly because they have a coin join service, uh, there's some terms and conditions. But like I said, the risks are not very high because you you are protected by the fact that they're never holding your coins you're always in control of your coins and also they cannot de-anonymize you so if you agree and uh, you have, first of all you have to create a password and the password is needed even if you have your 12 words because it acts like a 13 word that get at, gets added on top so you have to conserve both pieces and the password, you have to enter it every time you want to access the wallet or let's say make a transaction. So let's say I create a, a random password. So here you see, I get shown my words and normally I would have to write them. I'm not gonna write them because I'm not gonna use this wallet. So I would have to write these words down and I would have to write my password. So I click on, I wrote down my recovery words and now that I have, now I click on this wallet, um, I go on load wallet and I click on this wallet. Okay, so now I'm on the wallet. Normally I would have to first receive coins. So here you'd say test coins or whatever you want to know, name them, and then you can generate an address. It immediately copies it, but then I could click and copy it again. I could, I would have to send some Bitcoin here. Then I would have to go on CoinJoin, and in CoinJoin, my coins would show as different amount of coins. So it all depends how much I send. If let's say I send first one Bitcoin, it would show one Bitcoin. Let's, but let's say I send 
10 times 0.1 Bitcoin, then it will show 10 times 0.1 Bitcoin. That's how Bitcoin works in different coins, right? So let's, and they would all say like, these are not private or not mixed yet because I haven't passed them through Wasabi uh, mixing. So I click on one normally and you can also select all and then you have to do enter your password and you have to click on nq selected coins which means i want them i want my coins that i've selected to participate in the coin join round that will begin soon and you see this coin join round here is the status and you can see the minimum requirement is 0 0.95 0 0.095 bitcoin and you can also see that the coordinator fee is 0 0.03, 0.003 per anonymity set. So like I was saying earlier, the, the amount of fee is around 0.15 in this case because there's 55 peers. So you'd have to do 0.003% times 55, which is a little bit over 0.15. In some cases, and because there's only 55 registered peers, in some cases where there's 100 peers, you would have the fee be 0.3%. So that's how you know exactly how much fee you're gonna pay at this precise moment. So then after that, I, I'm, I don't have coins, so I cannot participate in this, but normally this would take around 15, 20 minutes for a transaction to be confirmed on the Bitcoin network. And then your coins would show as private and you would have them here. And then you can always send coins to another wallet, but you have to be aware because let's say you've mixed 2.1, we'll call them UTXOs or coins. And now you have two private coins, right? Of 0.1 amount. And then you go and send, but you click both and you send them to one address. Well, now someone that has that is analyzing the blockchain knows that a person who mixed coins out of this round and got two exits, two coins, is now sending both to the same address. So now they know that it must be the same person who owns both, right? So you got to be aware whenever you're spending coins after mixing, not to link them together once again right so and this is a, a normal uh bitcoin wallet and also at the beginning instead of doing what i did of generating a wallet i could have also just went on load wallet and if i had a hardware wallet connected to my computer which i don't the hardware wallet would just appear here and ledger and then I could send the Bitcoins that I've just mixed to my ledger on Wasabi Wallet itself. Actually, excuse me, I would have to go on Hardware Wallet. There's a different tab for that. So, and that's how Wasabi Wallet works. You can, I'm gonna show you the website. You can install it for Mac, Linux, and Windows. It's also open source, so you can, let's say, build it from source. And you have a docu some documentation here, uh, right on the website that can, easily explain all the steps and but also it talks about the more advanced steps and how the technology works behind the scenes right so this is i'm going to show you what a transaction looks like uh let's say this was what this one was made around a year ago in wasabi and you see that it begins here we're going to look at the outputs those that are exactly equal you see it begins here and it goes all the way down to it's really long it goes all the way down to 99 so there's 99 outputs that are exactly the same so if you enter this round and someone's trying to follow you they would have one chance out of 99 so that's how wasabi wallet works and and now i'm going to talk about other technologies so that's all fun but let's talk about let's say things that are bigger than, than Bitcoin so a VPN first a VPN in broad technical terms is a virtual private network so it's a way for you to connect to create your own network your own private network 
but beyond the barriers of a physical location. So let's say, let's say I have my phone and my computer in my house that are both connected to my router, and I want to send information from my computer to my phone. Do I have to go outside of my house, like I'm talking about on the network, and come back? No, I can just stay within my private network, within my house, to send information from one of my devices to the other. However, if I build a virtual private network and I want to send, let's say, information from my work to my home and I build a virtual private network between those, it's just going from my home to my directly to my work. It's not, let's say, routing through the regular Internet before getting there. So that's the difference. That's how you create a virtual private network. And what a lot of people uh, use it for, it's uh, let's say you can use it for, let's say, uh, connecting to your work without, let's say, uh, administration access rights. So let's say a lot of companies do this so that the firewall doesn't block the entry because uh, it just shows that it's, it's, it's part of the same network. So it's not an external request. But all we're going to talk about the usage that you use it for to route your traffic before reaching a destination. So let's say I'm connecting to facebook.com but I don't want Facebook.com to know that it's me, which in the case of Facebook.com might not be the best idea because I probably have an account with my name. So I can do use a VPN, which a VPN means that I can connect through a server as if it's in my own house, but it's, it's a virtual private network. And then that server connects to Facebook for me. So Facebook only sees that that server is connecting to Facebook, it doesn't see that I'm making a, a connection to, to Facebook. So basically, you can see the image here that this is kind of a meme, but it, it is kind of how it works. This is how a VPN works. You There's just someone in the middle that makes that seems to be the one that made the request from the destination point of view. So your address, your IP address is never seen. It's just the server who knows your IP address because you're you're making the request. So you gotta trust the service promise not to betray you. And you're paying him five for most services, five to ten dollars a month. So what happens if someone comes to the server's offices and offers them five hundred thousand dollars to see your activity and let's say a few more users of the company? Well the company just accept to share your data with uh, with the, the the person who came in and in a lot of cases they they just get bought out and they just sell you out so you're still trusting one other person not to betray your promise and you're only paying him five to ten dollars a month so you can also roll, roll your own let's say vpn your own server that you host somewhere and then you route your traffic through that uh, and here's this website that does it for Bitcoins without any sort of identification called hostforcoins.net. So, and that's done by a, a team that works on Bitcoin, uh, the null team. So uh, I think they, they have a, a lot of integrity, but even them uh, are not offering the VPN service. What they offer you is to run a server and on that server, you can run your own VPN. So it's a little, let's say, trusted, but still, they still have their hands on the physical hardware, right? Or you can also subscribe to a VPN service. You shouldn't use a free one. The free ones are almost always uh, selling your data or using it for other purposes. So how do you choose a VPN provider? Here's a website, that one privacysite.net slash simple VPN comparison and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna share the slides on the meetup group uh, and I'm gonna also share the slides on the chat towards the end of the conversation so that you can follow every link that I'll be presenting here uh, and any other information that I'm sharing. So and I'm gonna go on that website in a second. The two my two picks and of that website and other websites that I've seen are IVPN, it's based in Gibraltar, it's 834 dollars a month if you buy the annual package 
And Mulvat is probably the one with the best reputation, but and it's a little bit less expensive, $5.44 a month on the annual package once again, but it's based in Sweden, which some people might not like because it's a 14 eyes jurisdiction. 14 eyes, it's an intelligence group by many governments around the world that uh, share information between themselves and have some kind of intelligence rules between themselves. So some people don't like to be to have a VPN on some jurisdiction of the 14 eyes because they have, let's say, some more rules and are more inclined to spy on companies and, and their citizens. So, but still, Movad has maintained a very good reputation through the years, uh, and uh, which is very rare for, for most companies here uh, in, in the, this sphere. So here you can see that that website that I mentioned, Simple VPN Comparison, um, that one privacy site.net. So you see, you see that most most uh, VPNs here presented are all red, most of them. So um, and the, the the factors to consider are like where is it located? Is it logging the information? Um, is it uh, does it have good activism? Is it like say funding privacy activities? Is it open source? Things like that. Is it also sometimes the the server might not the company might not be um might not have bad intentions but they might have bad configuration and security so let's say let's take the case of nordvpn nordvpn got hacked a few months ago like two three months ago and now a hacker has all their all the information that was logged that was saved of the users right so if more than they say was saved well the hacker might be in possession of the information of the people that were using NordVPN. So there you see that it's also important for the provider to be extremely secure because they're holding to precious uh, information. So here I, I, I went through this and I got uh, IVPN and MoveAd were the two bigger, better picks, but there's also like very more advanced and technical comparison of all of the VPN providers as well. So you can see this is way more extensive and goes point by point. So I won't be spending more time on this, but I, I advise you to go through this if you want to make your own opinion on what's the, the best VPN out there. So movad.net uh, is the, the one that I'd say I advise the most, but keep in mind it's based in Sweden and might not be uh, the, the the best jurisdiction. So let's keep on. Let me, now let's talk about Tor. Tor is the and it's not a VPN. And by this meme that you see here, it's a lot of people think it's a VPN, but it's not. So Tor isn't a service, unlike the VPNs. It's a public network. And how does Tor work? So Tor, so whenever you're using a VPN, you're you you're the you're making a request to a server, and that server is making the your, the request that you wanted to the destination. So you're routing to one server, and that server knows where it came from and where it's going. However, Tor, you're doing the same thing, but you're routing in in a different way. You're routing to three servers. So the first server knows that you came where you came from. The second server doesn't know you or doesn't know your destination. And the third server knows your destination only. So that way, the trust is not only reliant on one server, one company, or one individual. It's divided between many servers that don't know each other at all because they're just random computers over the internet. and that's how you can ensure yourself that it's um, that that you have more privacy and more security. Also, every communication is encrypted, and it works in a way of uh, onions. So, how that means is that first of all, it has three levels of encryption, and every level has it can be only decrypted by the servers here. So, the first level can only be decrypted by the entry server, let's say the, the, the one you're sending to. The second layer 
can be only decrypted by the middle relay and the final the third uh, layer can only be decrypted by the exit relay and what does each level or um, layer hide of information it hides the address or the destination the next destination so the entry word as soon as it receives it it decrypts the first layer and now it knows how to get to the middle relay when, once the middle relay gets the information it decrypts the second layer and now it knows the exit relay uh, destinations address the, something that the entry word couldn't know because it couldn't decrypt the layer that had that information and the exit relay decrypts the final layer which reveals the destination uh, address or onion address so you can connect to normal internet domains and you win privacy but they don't because you're still connecting to either an ip address or a domain name which you know where it is and what what its name is and probably its jurisdiction so there's something called hidden services which are a way for the destination to remain private as well so these are also known as onion services or onion addresses and this is what most people call the dark web or the deep web because it's probably services that don't want to be discovered by anyone and they can do it using tor as well and it's way more private in a way that there's not only six relays there's there's not only three relays there's actually six relays so there's a lot of people talking about maybe tor was created by the government so this meme portrays that it says what if the tor browser was created by the government as a way of tracking online activity right the, the joke behind this is that the internet is already the way to track online activity. How can Tor browser be that? So Tor is used by the US military government to hide their own activities. So if the government is using it to hide their own activities, uh, it's probably because they trust the privacy behind it. So t Tor is not perfect. No one should say that but it's certainly the best available option and the less centralized alternative out there for internet privacy and you can also use you can use a tor browser which i'm going to show you in a second but you can also use tor with applications an example would be wasabi which has already tor wrapped within itself so whenever you just run wasabi it automatically starts tor on the background and every connection is done through tor but you can also use Tor on Android, which, which is called Orbot. We have an official version. It does have some unofficial versions, which I wouldn't particularly trust. But on Android, Orbot, which is, let's say, the, the Tor engine. And there's also Orfox, which is the um, browser. So on Android, using Orbot, you can link it with other applications. So let's say uh, there's some Bitcoin wallets that require you to use Orbot if you want to use them with Tor. So I'm going to show you uh, the Tor browser right now. So you can see that it's very simple. I just click on Tor browser after I install it. And that's it. I have a Tor browser now. And I have... Uh, I can always go here and click on new Tor circuit. This basically just changes the nodes, the relays that I'm connecting to. I can also do new identity and new identity just resets all the cache and all the, the, the information that I have on my browser. And it just becomes like a completely new window. And it also gives me a new route. So in here, I can do anything that I do normally. I can go on Google. It's, however, you got to consider that this, because it's routing to so many computers, it's more slow than, it's way slower. So here it's proposing me uh, uh, Dutch as a language because Google thinks that I'm coming from the Netherlands, right? Uh, if I do new Tor circuit, it's probably, uh, it's still Netherlands but 
uh, in, in some cases when I do new uh, new identity, new circuit, it's gonna give me another language because Tor doesn't it's it's just giving me another country. I'm not I don't know if that's gonna be the case. You see here there's another language. This one I'm not sure what it is. Maybe some of you know. So you see this is how Tor works. So it's like a I'd say it's a decentralized way of achieving privacy, at least way more than a VPN. But it has a trade-off, which is probably the speed. You cannot watch high-quality movies through Tor in real time. It's much, much slow. But you can do any sort of stuff that you do regularly on the internet. Plus, you can access the onions, the, the hidden services, which are onion addresses, usually deep web stuff. So that's how that works. And also you can probably guess that it's based on Firefox. It just has some, some additional components, obviously. So now let's get back to this. Uh, I'm gonna finish with saying not to ever use a light wallet if you wanna protect your privacy. We've written something on this. If you go on verify.io, slash en slash blog slash don't trust your light wallet you'll find an article that we wrote that basically compares a light wallet which is basically every bitcoin wallet with a full node and it goes through the privacy reasons why you shouldn't want to use a light wallet and i've mentioned a little bit of them before and they're almost always related to network privacy when you're using a light wallet, even after you've, let's say, mixed coins with Wasabi, you're revealing to either the server or the peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, well, the server, more likely, that you're connecting to, what are your addresses and that they're linked between themselves, and also what is your IP address. So let's say you use Wasabi and you mix your coins, but then you send them through your to your mobile wallet I don't know, bread wallet, mycelium wallet. Well, now mycelium or bread have a knowledge of your IP address and of your, that your addresses are linked between themselves. So they can begin the process of de anonymization. And a lot of wallets are working with blockchain analysis companies because they're getting paid for the data. And because it's hard to make money as a wallet, it's not an exchange. You don't have like a, a precise business model. So selling data might be a good viable option financially, but probably not morally. And so, and what happens later? What do these blockchain analysis companies do? Well, they work with Canadian government, the US government, so that people can pay taxes or maybe they just want to arrest a terrorist or a drug dealer but they can also work with the Saudi government which is tracking a journalist talking on, on the government so that they can imprison him and condemn him to a death sentence right so this can uh, and or blockchain privacy companies or excuse me blockchain analysis companies can also work with uh, organizations that just want to use that data for other purposes so it, it the, the the sources of interest to spy on you and to break your privacy are diverse so i would never i would wouldn't ever advise to use a light wallet you can use a full node instead go on bitcoincore.org to install a full node or you can at least use a vpn or at least use store so that you protect yourself from the the network privacy side of things. So finally, you can use Wasabi with a Cypher Node. Cypher Node is a backend API that application developers and businesses can use to develop their Bitcoin applications. And Cypher Node handles all the Bitcoin stuff. So you can create a wallet with Cypher Node programmatically. You can send coins, you can do many things, everything programmatically through an API. But you can also use Wasabi with the Cypher Node API. However, it's in a separate branch. It's not in the 
major release or the master branch. But you can use it uh, today. It's available and you can create a wallet on Wasabi with the HTTPS REST API. You can then receive coins, mix coins, spend coins, which and so basically you can do the whole Wasabi process programmatically. Some people might want to do this for their applications, for their businesses, uh, and you can always approach me to help you with this if you need it. So here you have some advanced reads. Uh, privacy section of the Bitcoin Wiki is probably the most complete uh, article you'll find out there on Bitcoin privacy. It goes through in more detail of what I presented on the issues behind Bitcoin privacy. It goes through every heuristic or every, let's say, uh, thing that these companies use to base themselves before analyzing and targeting uh, Bitcoin users. You can also read a modest privacy protection proposal by James M. Lop, and you'll find it in his blog at blog.lop.net. He talks about VPNs, he talks about, but he talks about privacy in a bigger sense. Like it's really how to disappear, like how to not have anything linked to your name, how to not have your house, your car, your companies, anything, nothing linked to your name. And this can probably only be done in the US. I've tried to look up some things in Canada and it's much harder, let's say, to get a phone without identifying yourself in Canada, much easier in the US. It's much harder to get a credit card in Canada without identifying your, yourself. But still, I, I find it quite interesting. He And the reason why he did that is because he's a public personality and a lot of, and some people have targeted him. He's been swatted and swatted means of being pranked, um, but it's a very nasty prank and it's extremely legal. I think you can face more than 10 years in jail. You basically call the 911, someone called the 911 and said uh, there's an active shooter at this address and they, he gave the James Simpson address. So then the SWAT uh, in 10, five minutes got in his house uh, and this can be extremely dangerous because whenever uh, a SWAT team gets to a place being told that there's an active shooter, well, they're extremely ready to, to take someone down. And so uh, this is what some people have done, SWATting. Uh, so that's why he wants to protect everything privacy-wise he, because he doesn't want to have any type of risks like that. So, but but it's it's important for, for anyone to have at least some level of that. Sure, he's a person public personality so he's he becomes more of a target but still so i also advise to go on docs.wasabiwallet.io if you want to look up the more advanced stuff on wasabi wallet finally cyphernode on github if you want to use cyphernode you can always contact me as well and tourproject.org is where you'll find the information on tour and if you want to understand a little bit how it works, you can do that, right? You can also donate to Tor Project. They only revolve around donations. And a lot of people also say Tor is probably controlled by the U.S. government because they fund most of it. And it's true. Tor used to fund 80, 85 percent of all, excuse me, the, the U.S. military used to fund um, to fund 80 to 85 percent of Tor's revenue. Now it's down to let's say 50 percent, which is still high. And some people think this is bad. Well, if you want to change that, donate yourself. So finally, privacytools.io is probably, and I think I'll go through that in a second to show you. Here you have every tool that you can find, and it's 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 done in a pretty user friendly way. So let's say it even explains how, why you need it. Uh, here, but let's say I want to go through providers. So I click on providers and I have some cloud storage providers here I have which are privacy respecting ones. I have uh, some jurisdiction here. It talks about the 14 eyes, which I mentioned earlier. You can choose your and that's where I also got the VPN advice. Here you can see VPN. It shows MOVAD and why Proton. It also recommends Proton VPN, but I saw on the other website that Proton VPN the other website isn't sure about the business ethics behind Proton VPN. 
Um, I haven't gone through that deep, so that's why I left it out. So IVPN is also here. But you can see you have everything here. You have browser recommendation. It recommends Firefox or Tor browser. Uh, it has many things, DNS, email, hosting, social networks, social news aggregators, uh, anything privacy related, even all type of software for your calendar, for file sharing. Uh, you can find many things here. So privacytools.io, really recommend it. So thank you for listening and I'll take your questions. You can follow us at verify.io, that's our website. You can follow our newsletter, you'll find it there. Also on Twitter, we're VerifyBTC. And you can also contact me if you have any questions or inquiries, if you need help setting anything of this up, or if you wanna make a project out of this or use it in your own business. Uh, you can contact me at Gustavo at verify.io or on Twitter, I'm Gustavo G underscore Flores. Thank you. You can use the microphone or the chat. I'll actually be checking the chat. I haven't had a chance to see if there were any questions that came up. But anybody is free to, to take the mic and, and begin asking questions. I don't see any questions. Mm. Ah, David asked if I can talk about Tor over VPN versus Tor over the, the open internet. So this is a good question, David. So I, I, I you've talked about this before and I, a little bit, I've uh, analyzed what, how Tor and VPN works. And I've gotten mixed uh, reviews from that. So some people say that uh, you would have to use Tor over VPN. So basically you're connecting to VPN first and then you're connecting to Tor so that you can have more privacy. What I'd say towards that is that who are you looking privacy from? If you're looking privacy from your, let's say your ISP, either Bell, Videotron, so that you don't want them to know you're using Tor, it might not be the worst idea, but also you can also use a Tor bridge, which is uh, in, the, in the step when I show you Tor browser, when you're configuring, you can choose a Tor bridge. And a Tor bridge is basically a computer that you can connect to before connecting to Tor that isn't on the public Tor nodes. So that your ISP doesn't know you're connecting to Tor. So that's a way to mitigate uh, that. Also, uh, when you're using a VPN, um, you're, you're definitely trusting someone. So you don't know how the Tor, the Tor VPN, the, the VPN can, let's say, manipulate your Tor configuration without you knowing it. And that's not always the case, but that's in some cases where a company offers like a Tor over VPN service they can manipulate the Tor configuration, which might not be that good for yourself. So basically what I'm saying is there might be some advantages, some places, but it's not exactly clear. It's not that much for the cost involved and also for a little bit more of trust. So I'm not exactly sure it's, it's a winning solution. Because a lot of people say also Tor is de-anonymized by the US government and or other governments. And I, I, I don't think that's actually true. I think there's been some vulnerabilities to Tor, like there's been vulnerabilities to basically everything, and they've been resolved. But I'd say, I, I, I don't think Tor over VPN is necessary, um, unless you're probably, unless let's say you're in, let's say China or a country like that, where you really wanna make sure you're not seen using Tor. Okay, so then does Monero coins work the same way? Chris asks that. So Monero works in a very different way. 
as coin join. Monero or Bitcoin. Monero uses a few more technologies than Bitcoin. So it uses um, ring signatures, stealth addresses, and confidential transactions. So basically what it does, it, it works a little bit like liquid in the sense that it has confidential transactions. So it has the amounts, the amounts are not seen. It also does ring signatures, which are not exactly the same as the same thing as coin joints. Well, they're similar as coin joints, but instead of coins being mixed, signatures are being mixed. So you still have a concept of the transaction is this address out of this many. So that's how ring signatures provides it. And you also have stealth addresses and stealth addresses is uh, when you're sending it to an address, it doesn't directly send it. It doesn't send it to the address. It derives another address from that address and it sends it to the address that was derived for. So if I recap, Monero hides the amounts. It does a ring signature, which means like a coin join, but between signatures. So you have one, you're one out of 10, uh, one out of 25 of the ones that sent it. And the way you obfuscate who received it is you have a stealth address, which is, let's say, a front address that every time it receives coins, it sends it to a different back address, let's say. So that's the how Monero differentiates. But the ring signature part by many is considered unproven cryptography, which CoinJoin doesn't add any type of cryptography implications. It just uses regular Bitcoin transactions while available Bitcoin transactions just of making many inputs and many outputs. So I'd say that's the main trade-off between Monero and Bitcoin privacy. And also when you're using Bitcoin, you're, you're, you have way more liquidity available for yourself. How many people are using Monero? Way less than people using Bitcoin. So thank you, Ugo. I am glad you liked the presentation. So Tristan says, I have received the Trojan through a Firefox extension. Nothing is perfect. You got to be very careful with all the browser extensions. They are, they, they always, not they're always, but I always hear on new viruses, Trojans being introduced through extensions. So you, you got to be extremely careful at that. I, if I could recommend some, and you can find them on the website that I presented, privacytools.io, under like like I think Firefox uh, tweaks. Or, well, you can find all the Firefox tweaks first of all for extra privacy, but I think it has some browser add-ons. These are the only ones that I recommend: are uBlock, which it blocks ads and trackers, HTTPS Everywhere, which enforces HTTPS. So that your communications are always encrypted, and um, this site recommends decentralized. I'm not exactly sure I would they recommend uh, decentralized, but it might not be bad since since it's here. So beware on the extensions. A lot of extensions will tell you this does this, but it's not always the case. And sometimes they even mine Bitcoin with your browser or other cryptocurrencies. FC asks, uh, well, says, I regrettably miss most of this presentation. Will the recording be available for later viewing? Yes, it will be available on our YouTube channel, Bitcoin Montreal. And we will be presenting every presentation there. And most likely, we will also be cutting it in pieces if you just want to extract one part of the presentation instead of watching the whole hour and a half long presentation. Then... Peter asks, can websites detect if you're using VPNs? There, sometimes, like if you're using um, a publicly registered VPN, so let's say you can, you're using a very popular VPN like Movad or NordVPN or ExpressVPN, they're most likely gonna know you're using a VPN because NordVPN 
has a, these VPNs have a registry of their VPNs. So these websites, Google, Netflix, YouTube, they go on these registries and they just look up every IP address, every server, and they add it to their VPN list. So yes, whenever you're using NordVPN or ExpressVPN, the popular ones, you will get alerted by Netflix. By the way, you cannot do this you're using a VPN. Sure, they add some servers and a lot, they add a lot of servers all the time and you have all these new VPN services. So it might not be on their list, but they're very quick to react, I tell you. But if you're using your own VPN, uh, where you're rolling your own server, then it might be harder. Uh, it's probably impossible for them to detect it. Peter then asks, is Wasabi Wallet safe for use in sweeping e-cold wallet and transferring the bounds to an exchange if you want to convert a portion to fiat. Well, it depends how your paper wallet, what the form of your paper wallet is. Is your paper wallet a 12 word wallet? If, if it is, then yes, you can sweep paper wallets with Wasabi wallet. However, if your paper wallet is a private key, you cannot, I don't think you can sweep private keys with Wasabi wallet. If you want to look, if you want to know how to sweep your paper wallet and which wallet to use for that, you can go on Verify's Bitcoin software wallet analysis, and then you'll see every wallet and how they compare in regards to sweeping paper wallets. You can see that on the line called import keys. And if it says import private keys and your paper wallet is in a private key format, then you'll know that you can do that through that. So. I hope that answered your question. Um, then Chang Ji Yang talks, uh, says, is Brave Browser a good alternative to Tor? So there's this talk about Brave Browser that I've heard that it's, 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 that it's, it's a very popular browser nowadays, particularly within the privacy and crypto community. So what I'd say about that is that Brave Browser is, um, it's not as safe and private as Tor, first of all. N nothing is as safe and private as Tor. Uh, but I, a Brave Browser might be better than using, let's say, Google Chrome, which is, or Internet Explorer. But I don't think Brave Browser is safer than a well-configured Firefox. And But also, I don't think Brave Browser is, is also... I don't use it not only for that reason, but also I don't use it because it has this weird token in, in economic system where you can get tokens to uh, be, to share your data with uh, Brave the, the Brave company. And so, first of all, I'm not sure I would trust the Brave company, as I'm not sure you should trust any companies. And I don't have that with Firefox. If I block all my ads and trackers. I have basically the same thing that Brave proposes, but Brave says, we're gonna pay you. But then when they pay you and you wanna withdraw your BAT, which are the, the crypto token from your Brave browser, then they ask you to KYC. They say, send us a copy of your passport and a proof that you of your residence. And then yeah, you can withdraw the rewards you got by selling us your data. And how can that be a privacy preserving and respecting company? It's not. Uh, to me, this is just a way for them to raise funds. Brave raised $32 million through the basic attention token ICO. They did it in 30 seconds. And by telling investors this is a good investment, but then hiding under their legal documents, this is not a recommended investment and will go to zero. So I don't trust the Brave team. I think they're very malicious and there are many controversies around them. And people ask them, why do you, don't you use Bitcoin? Why do you have to create your own token and to, to, to raise money that way and, and that you can basically print at will? And they said, nobody was willing to give us Bitcoins for free. So we didn't want to use Bitcoin. So they're admitting that this is just a way for them to raise money. So I don't advise Brave Browser in short. Uh, Peter says, thanks, Gustavo. Great presentation. Thank you, Peter. 
Hey, Gustavo, I just wanted yes. to comment. What is your opinion on um, uh, Gab browser since uh, it's a fork off of Brave? Uh, they removed all of the uh, altcoin uh, additions that they added. And uh, they also uh, implemented the, the center plugin into it, which allows uh, users to uh, comment, leave comments on pretty much any uh, URL which is uh, interesting because uh, when you go to like a news website, a lot of times, you know, they've removed the comment section because they don't want people uh, commenting on the news anymore. So they're trying to remove free speech. And uh, if you could also comment on the, if uh, the security of the Brave uh, browser, uh, sorry, the Gab fork of Brave is uh, any better uh, than uh, the uh, original Brave browser and how that might compare also with uh, Firefox. Thanks for the question, Jose. So I'd say that uh, they're all Chromium-based uh, forks. So Chromium is the open source version of Google Chrome. And I'd say that the center is interesting because it provides a comment section to basically all the every website on the web, uh, which is which is interesting for, for people to, to comment on and chat about uh, a particular subject and to, to, let's say, create a, a, a layer on top of websites where you can communicate without censorship from the website. But I'd say as well that, it, it to me, it's still not, uh, from a browser point of view and not from the, the center point of view, I'd still think that uh, a well-configured Firefox with the right add-ons uh, is superior, or, or Tor browser is superior in terms of privacy or security to, um, to, to either Brave or or Gab browser. And I also say that uh, I, Gab is very often just open sourcing a project, uh, excuse me, forking an open source project, modifying a few components, and then adding their logo and their branding and then releasing it. So they're adding very little value, uh, but the center sure is interesting. Um, but I don't know the usage, uh, and I don't know uh, whether that, that's maybe a, a feature that would interest many people. I, I, I don't use it. I don't think it's bad. I think it's, uh, but I just think a well-configured Firefox or a Tor browser is, is, is better in terms of privacy or security. Thank you. Yeah, I had one more question, actually. Um, yes. What do you recommend for, like, when you set up your VPN, do you recommend setting the VPN through the little application that comes with it on each of your uh, devices or to just, like, configure it straight into the router? So that's a very good question as well. And I'd say if you want to go for the, the easiest way, sure, you can use the, the VPN software. And very, very often, these are open source, and, and if you want to build it yourself, you can do it. So, but if you want to have it, let's say uh, another level of uh, privacy, you can install it on your router. Usually, these VPNs follow the Open VPN protocol, which for it to to use other type of so, uh, software, usually routers, instead of using the the client side. Ver version offered by the company. So when you use it on your router, it automatically, every computer doesn't have to be installed with the VPN that's in that private network because everything is getting routed through the router which is connecting to the VPN. So it's I'd say it's much easier uh, to set up one router instead of setting up 10 computers inside a network. Also, you have a limit on the amount of computers that you can set up with a VPN service often. So if you set it up on a router, you just have set up one device. If you set it up in 10 computers, you've set up 10 devices. And if your limit is five, well, you cannot set up 10 devices. So that's, it's better there as well. And I, but you gotta be careful because not every router can be set up with a VPN. And also, you got to be careful on the, on the final point, which is probably for those who are more, uh, who want to get the, the, the best setup, is you can add a kill switch to a few VPNs and, and you can, or a few routers. 
and that kill switch means that if the VPN server goes off, you that it immediately cuts any type of communication being made made from your network, so that you never have one second of non VPN connection. So there's a way to do that, and that's what a lot of people who want to have perfect setups recommend to have the kill switch. And that let's say it's help. It's it's useful in the, some cases where let's say you're connecting to a service that if your real location is revealed, you would get shut down from the service. So let's say BitMEX, which is a futures derivatives trading platform, is banned in Quebec and in the United States, I think, as well. So if you're using it from uh, Quebec and you have a VPN, and let's say you have two Bitcoins in your account and you're trading with two Bitcoins, and your VPN goes down for a second, and you reveal to BitMEX that you're an IP address coming from Montreal, boom, your account is locked out and your two Bitcoins are lost. So that has happened to many people. Tone Vase, which is uh, one of the most popular traders, he got shut down his BitMEX account because he's from the US and he tweeted that he was making a trade on BitMEX and they saw it and boom, he, shut, he got shut down and he lost many Bitcoins. So. In that, in those cases, if you want to take the risk of using BitMEX or something you're not allowed for in your jurisdiction, well, just make sure that you're using a kill switch or something like that, so that you'd never expose your your real IP address. Any other questions? In the meantime, I'll be sharing the slides. Yes. Yeah, one more question. Uh, when in the VPN settings, and uh, I think it's an open VPN, uh, there's uh, one of the settings shows like choose between TCP and UDP. And I think UDP has some advantages over TCP, like maybe it's faster or something. Is that what you would recommend when you're using the VPN? Mm, well, some, some people, some routers, also some services don't support UDP. So I'd say to stay on TCP unless you explicitly need UDP. Um, if it's faster or not, some people say it is. It might be, but I, I don't really see the, the, the advantage, particularly if you're a non-experienced user uh, of using UDP. Uh, so unless you know and you have a good reason to use it, I don't, I don't recommend to use it. Just as an aside, do you want to hear about UDP technically? I have a joke that illustrates UDP, but maybe it's not relevant to the wasabi. Ah, go ahead. What so there's, there's a joke you can tell technical people. They say, if I give you a UDP joke, you might not get it. That's the joke. Because in huh. UDP, there's no check, double check, confirmation. In TCP, that's what it's all about. The server's check each, did you receive the latest packet? Should I resend it? But UDP, that's why it's faster because you just send and send and forget. They presume you received it. So the joke again is you say, I could tell you a UDP joke, but you might not get it. And then they all burst out laughing. That's assuming they know what UDP is. Okay, I I, uh, I I can understand the joke there. Uh, yeah, it's it's interesting because I had no idea that that was like the main thing about UDP, and that's why it has an advantage uh, and it makes it faster. But yeah, it does make sense. It's uh, it's interesting. The, the packets are also smaller. Yeah, so UDP is older. It was the original one, and TCP was made ab on top of it in order to account for the problem of lost packets or packets that were not received in the right order because one was delayed by a minute. All kinds of silly things that could happen when servers are sending to servers or sending to servers. So uh, TCP is much more, you might say, reliable under normal conditions. All right. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. Great uh, explanation and joke. Any other questions, comments? Anybody want to share a joke, maybe? Yeah, I want to share a joke. I sent somebody uh, an SMS. I said, rate our solar system one star or more. That's the joke. 
you have to read it maybe is rate the solar system one star or more mm. the the sun the sun is is a star right and our solar system has just one star in it uh, okay i see what you mean so it takes a bit of thought, and then they burst out laughing. But that's great. You could, that's a good little SMS joke because um, I like the UDP one better. I think. Right. So I was it's looking so for really, really brief jokes recently. Extremely brief jokes because all of the messages were getting very heavy. You know. Right. So I shared the slides. Um, Tristan asks, what do you think of streamed wallet for mining bitcoins? I don't I don't know what a stream wallet is, to be honest with you. Uh, I haven't heard of that. Do you have more details? Uh, I'm maybe thinking you're talking about cloud mining. Yeah, I did a quick Google and I didn't find anything for stream wallets. So um, let me know if you have some more details, Tristan. Since uh, you made a, the, this uh, meetup about uh, privacy a little bit also, um, I wanted to ask you your opinion on search engines. Uh, is uh, DuckDuckGo your preferred go-to engine or is there other ones like maybe I heard about Quant or maybe you have an idea about other ones that uh, are worth mentioning? Good question. So you can use DuckDuckGo. I, I, I think it's getting better. But originally it had it just gave you back so many uh, such worse results than than Google, right? So it's like I went to DuckDuckGo and then I came back to Google because the results weren't as good. I've and some people think it's 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 fine and it's it's definitely getting better. Um I, I use startpage.com because I think the results are better than DuckDuckGo. However, I've been told by some people that StartPage, they, they have the, the DuckDuckGo issue with StartPage, that they're getting bad results on StartPage. I think DuckDuckGo makes their own searches. However, StartPage is just basing themselves on Google searches, but they're just not, you're not connected to Google directly. So I'd say that's the difference there. So, however, I think there's other um, that you can, let's say, run your own uh, Google, uh, not Google, but search engine that connects to Google. I, I don't know how it works exactly. So I think there's ways to run your own, let's say, bridge. That might be interesting as well. But uh, yeah, startpage.com, that's what I use. And, but DuckDuckGo is, is very good as well. What do you think about the DuckDuckGo browser? What is that forked off, uh, or is that like completely internally made by them? That's a good question. I hadn't heard of the DuckDuckGo browser. I'll take a look at that really quickly, and I'll give you a short answer on that. I'll go through uh, through David's topic first. Uh, any new topic? How much privacy is the right amount? When and why? It really depends it depends on and i think that's what's ultimately this is all very personal for everyone what do you what are you looking for and in which amount are you looking for privacy and very often is what who are you protecting yourself from that's usually the the first question to ask yourself are you doing this to um, protect yourself from a foreign government from your own government are you doing this to protect yourself from the big tech companies, from your maybe from your from your service provider, from your internet service provider, maybe you're doing this to protect yourself against hackers and people or people that might physically attack your house to steal your bitcoins. So those questions are always that I think that's the first question you ask yourself: Who are you protecting yourself from? And then you'll find a solution based on that. But you can never find nothing is perfect. So. Uh, you got to choose who you're protecting from because the solutions might have trade-offs that might make you consider, yeah, I might do this because I'm not looking for protection from, from these people, but them instead. So that might be the, the first question to ask yourself. I'll look up DuckDuckGo browser just a second.
Okay, so I didn't find much information on Dog Dog Browser, I, but I'll get back to you on that, Jose. Uh, but for those in the conversation, uh, unfortunately, I don't know uh, right off the bat. So then uh, David says, let's put it this way, when to give up privacy. So then again, it, it, it's who do you trust? Do you trust, maybe you trust your, your bank, may, so you want to give up privacy there maybe you don't want to use all those weird applications and have a bad user experience so you stop where the user experience stops maybe you're not that very technical so you stop where technical requirements are needed i'd say for myself i'd say that i'm still we're still using a google product right this is done through google meet so this is not very private i'd say but I would I, I still use this over Zoom because and, and the reason why I'm doing this over Google because it's gonna be posted on YouTube anyway. So uh, and YouTube is another Google product. So but I still prefer this over Zoom because Zoom would has not only has the same privacy issues, it also has some security issues. At least I know that Google's not getting hacked, right? And someone's not gonna like intercept our conversation or someone's not going to randomly guess our room and just um, f nakedly flash themselves like people have been through on Zoom. So that's why I'd say Google Meet is better. Even if it's bad privacy, I still uh, I still choose it over Zoom. So that's you see, that's the case where I've given up privacy because I'm already going to publish it to YouTube. Um, but other cases where I give up privacy, I'd say when it comes to business decisions, sometimes I give up privacy because when it comes to Verify, because Verify is a company registered in Quebec that has to go through this, through has to pay taxes and has to go through uh, through the regulation. So do I have that much uh, intention of? being all so secretive on regards of uh, verify operations well i i know I, i'll have to pay taxes anyway i have to uh i have to declare basically everything anyway and if a government letter comes i have to comply with it anyway so i'd see a, an organization has let's say more responsibility as an individual the the government's not i don't think it's going to send my me a, a form that says hey you have to uh, comply with uh, this new law right not like that or we can we have to search up your your, your house it, it, it requires more effort to go after an individual than to go after a company so I'd say that that's also a, some a place where I'm, I might make uh, less privacy decisions anybody want to share their experience on that well it might not be the best idea because you're you're talking well I agree with the conversation about privacy there is a limit suppose we are we geeks are all capable of creating the best privacy ever then we know that we have to start creating our own form of policing police because some people will use the extreme extremely available privacy uh, for to do things that we would not agree with so then we have to recreate the whole world system all over again I hope I'm uh, we can have a conversation about that some other day it's already been an hour and a half so it's too it's too late to start that to topic. But do you remember Zero Net? I don't even know what happened to it. But uh, Zero Net nice. is definitely interesting. Zero Net is uh, is a way to make websites on BitTorrent, and it uses the Bitcoin uh, public key system where you have a, a Bitcoin address and um, your public and private key. And the one, and when you create a website, you create it with a public key. And only the one that owns the private key yourself can modify that website on the, the BitTorrent network. And it's uncensorable because it's, it's on BitTorrent, so it's hosted in many, um, in many computers at the same time. And it's only you can modify it because it uses Bitcoin privacy to enforce that. So yeah, ZeroNet is very interesting, but however, it might, you can just use Tor as well. I think a lot of people just use Tor um, because Tor is also uncensorable in a way. 
it's also extremely private so i'd say might be uh i, I think zero need didn't take off because store already resolved that issue Gustavo, what is your opinion uh, on uh, privacy on mobile devices? Have you done any research on the uh, various uh, forks of uh, Android for privacy, like uh, the one Matt Odell recommended, Graphene OS, and uh, what applications might be uh, working on them, like what wallets uh, uh, you could use on these? Very good question. So what about android forks and other type of mobile os so the simple but hard answer is just don't use a mobile phone uh but then it's just not it's so convenient to use a mobile phone so if you're stuck using a mobile phone at least use an android version if you want privacy uh, a fork of android sure you can use graphene os i think it's good but they all have the limit that you can only use them on pixels uh, which are Google hardware. So, and so then you're like, okay, maybe there's like a hardware issue here. Maybe, uh, and there are some ways to make some hardware to, to, to add some hardware security issues. I'd say it's, it's certainly, it, it certainly isn't a bad idea to use Graphene OS, but I'm not sure about the compatibility with, uh, every service provider when it comes to the phone. Uh, maybe someone has an experience with that that can talk. I, I, I have never used it, to be honest. And also, I'm not sure, you cannot use any application that uses Google Play service because that's the, the, the item that it removes. And you'd be surprised at the amount of applications on Android that use Google Play service. Uh, and many of the big ones you, you couldn't use. I'm not sure which exactly. You can probably find that information online. But if you have the APK of uh, the, let's say the APK is the, the launcher of the, the, of the software, well, you can probably use the, the application if you have the APK. So I think most Bitcoin wallets are, you can have the APK, at least the ones that I recommend, Blue Wallet, Blockstream Green, even Samurai Wallet, which is not the best for privacy, but still is a respectable Bitcoin wallet. Uh, for mobile, for Android. Uh, so even Bread, I think it has an APK. So I think most Bitcoin wallets, you could still use them. But I, I'm not sure how much of the mainstream software you could use. Tristan asks, does it make sense to pay a distant company to mine for you? Could mining be interesting for individuals? This is a this is a recurring question, and and I've asked myself that question before, and, and I've known. I think everybody asks themselves this question at a certain point, right? So I don't advise it at all. <laughs> I'd say stay very away from that. If they're not scams, they just won't make you money at all. So anyone to mine bitcoins. This from this is a this is cloud mining. So that's what I expected it was. Cloud mining, first of all, is the worst form of mining. At least because cloud mining is never profitable or almost never. Um, and also because you're completely trusting a random person on the internet who could just fully default on you and not pay you nothing back. At least when you have a miner, you have a certainty that you're going to get some money out of it. Maybe you're not going to be profitable, but you might recover some money that you invested. When you're using a cloud mining, you have the risk of the website just disappearing. And it has happened many times. They just disappear. So you might be using one of the popular ones, like Genesis Mining, I think is one of the most popular ones. But still, it's never profitable. It's always false marketing, telling you you're gonna make this amount of money. It's rarely true. And I don't advise anyone to mine Bitcoins unless they have a couple million dollars to invest. And maybe a couple million dollars is not enough. Maybe you would need a couple tens or a couple hundreds of millions. I think Bitcoin mining is a big business. And if you wanna be make money out of it, and you don't have a lot of money, I don't advise anyone to get into it.
uh, one of the reasons I, I was looking into the privacy on the mobile devices and I kind of went for the graphene was because of uh, Matt Odell's uh, recommendation, uh, which he did recently. And, and the prices on the Pixel 3 phones, uh, the 3As were, were good because I think they're phasing them out. But uh, before that, I had been looking uh, for a long time into the uh, Librem phone, I think, uh, from that uh, Purism company. But it was taking forever to come out the phone and... Uh, it was uh, very expensive on top of that for the hardware you were getting compared to uh, what was available on the market from like Android or uh, iOS. And uh, so what, and I, then I also looked into the Pine 64 phone and I was like going through the forum posts and it looked like, oh man, this project is like nowhere uh, near from uh, being ready anytime soon. And the battery usage was bad. Uh, it was a very little application support. So when I heard of the uh, the uh, graphene, it seemed like uh, one of the better choices out there right now. But I also wanted, I had also been curious about the, the possibility of uh, uh, hardware mobile devices that would connect through a mesh network. Do you know of any other projects that are interesting and that are like available right now on that? Good question, Jose. And so. You talk about Pine, and I think they're more advanced now than they were before. And I, but I still think it's like very close to like developer. Um, it's, I think it's still in developer mode, right? So, but I, I'm not sure whether it's ever going to be popular and it's ever going to be the same thing, right? So we'll see on that. Um, but I think it's much cheaper than, let's say, Librem. I think, so it wouldn't necessarily, I'm not sure it would be a bad idea. I think it's like 150 bucks. So it might not be a bad idea. And and it, it's like Ubuntu, but on phone, I think. So I might I might get it at some moment, to be honest. I, I looked it up, and I was thinking of getting it when it's ready. Yeah, it's 150 bucks. So not really not bad. When it comes to uh, mesh networks, well, you also mentioned Librem. So Librem is definitely more expensive. I think it's like 700 US bucks and the hardware is just not worth that. But uh, a lot of people have good experience with Librem and they also had computers, laptops, and they were good because I think the laptops had like have physical switches to turn off the camera, to turn off the mic. I, I like that. I like the fact that you can have physical switches to uh, to turn off your hardware. However, when it comes to mesh networks, I don't think, first of all, there's much, I, I've, I haven't seen much there. I, I have seen some projects here and there on mesh networks. I think it works, it, it all depends on your network. Where are you situated, right? I think if you have, if you work in, uh, if you are in New York City, I think you have much put, more, more potential. I think there's a project called NYC Mesh, where you can get mesh network uh, internet for like 15 bucks a month. That might not be a bad idea, uh, but I don't think there's like much potential for that um, everywhere, right? So Gotenna is uh, is not a bad idea, right? But you cannot do like, there's it's not internet Gotenna, it's like chat. And you can also send Bitcoin transactions through Gotenna. So uh, I'd say Gotenna is not a bad idea for that, for communication or for Bitcoin, which is Bitcoin transactions are communication at the end of the day. Well, what is it? But then for mesh network phones, I, I haven't seen much on that. And honestly, I I have a hard time seeing how it can uh, have a, can succeed a lot, right? So yeah. Any other questions before we wrap this up? Comments, suggestions? I sent the slides to the chat and I also posted them on the uh, uh, meetup.com website. So you can find it there. We'll also post the YouTube, cha YouTube channel, well, the YouTube video when the when it comes out on the channel, on the uh, on the event, and uh, yes, um, I think we're gonna finish this unless anybody has a last question. Thank you. 
All right. Thanks, Gustavo. Thanks for answering all of my questions. A very interesting uh, meetup today. My pleasure. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good uh, evening. Take care. Till next time.